Ladies, open your Bibles again to Colossians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse number 4. Uh, is I'm sorry, verse number 3 is our text verse uh, this morning. Uh, we'll reread uh, these verses in just a few minutes, but verse number 3 is my text verse. For ye are dead, and then notice this phrase, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Make note of that. Uh, maybe mark it in some way. Your life is hid with Christ in God. I'm going to preach on that subject, hid with Christ in God. Are you comfortable this morning? Is it, is it warm, cool? Is everybody all right? That's what the dentist asked me just before he uh, inflicted pain. But anyway, I didn't mean that. I thought of that when I said it, but uh, uh, I didn't want, don't want to get too hot. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the preaching. Heavenly Father, it's a joy to open the Word of God and, Lord, to uh, see a truth and to use uh, what you have called preaching <clears throat> to magnify uh, to illuminate uh, the truth. And Lord, I pray that it would not just be the preaching, but it would be the work of the Holy Spirit that would help us to see and help us to understand uh, the truth that we're looking at and we're hearing from this morning. I ask you, Lord, to fill me with your Spirit, and I ask that you give us what we need this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Word of God is a well or a well spring of truth. I'm amazed at the truth that is in the Word of God. Truth like fresh water that gives a spiritual satisfaction like nothing else can do. When I first started preaching, I thought uh, I had a concern uh, what I would preach after I'd preached through the Bible. And uh, I thought, man, I, if I preach long, I'll run out of the Bible. But it's amazing how many times you go back to the same well and find not only the truth that you once found, but yet another truth and a, another truth and another. And the same is the case at this morning. I preached from this passage of Scripture, and I preached from this verse before, and I preached the message that we are secure in Christ, and we are. Uh, we are secure in Christ. I'm glad that he didn't tell me to hold on, but he's holding on to me. Uh, there's a great big difference in that. I'm glad that I'm not uh, hanging on, but I am in His hand, and I am, uh, I am secure in Him. I have preached from this verse preaching that we have the peace of God and we have assurance of our salvation from this passage of Scripture. I preached on the assurance, the peace, the security uh, that we have in the world of the devil or nobody can get to us uh, because as he says in the book of John, I'm in his hand and here he says, I am hid with Christ in God. Notice the passage again, he says, if you be risen with Christ, verse 1, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, make a decision to love, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, we're dead to the old life, ah, but thank God our life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory." There is more in this well or well spring of pure water. These verses say more than my soul is securing God. My soul is securing God, but these verses say more than that. I want you to notice the word that says my life. My life. If it says life, it means life. If it says soul, it means soul. And there are different words used and used for purpose and on purpose. And here it says my life or our life is hid with the Christ in God. Notice it step by step. First of all, your life. That means all of it, body, soul, and spirit. All that pertains to life. All of it is hid with Christ in God. And notice the words is hid. That means it cannot be seen or it cannot be gotten to. 
it is covered or it is secured. It is protected. Things that are valuable uh, that you have in your home are typically hidden, sometimes in a safe, sometimes in a place, uh, certainly where it is secure, and you feel assurance that it is hidden. So he says, your life, all of it, body, soul, and spirit is hid, cannot be seen, cannot be gotten to, is covered, is secured. Notice the Bible says, with Christ, or Christ is with us. Wherever we're hid, we're hid with Christ. Not just we're hid in Christ, but we're hid with Christ. Notice the wording here. He is with us, and where we are hidden is in God. So I am with Christ, and I'm hidden with Christ in God. That means I'm never alone. I am always with him. He is always with me. And so your life is hid with Christ in God. Let me give you this illustration to help us understand this passage of Scripture. My wife and I both grew up in Appalachia. She grew up in Knott County. I grew up in Perry County. And my wife and I, uh, after we got married in 1987, uh, we worked together on a bus route that I had uh, had since I was an early teenager down in uh, Breathitt County, the Perry and Breathitt County line down through uh, on Route 15, Ned uh, over in River Caney, Watts, all that area right in there. I tried to have 100 on my bus. I believe 97 uh, was the most people ever had on my bus. And I, I ran a bus there and my wife went with me uh, after we got married and we worked that route together. And uh, we won many, many people to Christ and families and children and teens to Christ uh, together on the bus. I remember uh, when Joel was born, uh, we strapped the car seat uh, in the bus and he was on a bus route from the time he was a little bitty fella and uh, still drives a bus today. Now, as you know, in Appalachia, that's not the wealthiest part of our state. It isn't. Uh, in fact, I didn't know I was poor until I grew, uh, grew up and left. I didn't know it. I thought everybody lived like we did. And, uh, but, but life was uh, simple. I recall a dear lady that rode my bus every Sunday. Her name was Samantha, Samantha Bush. And uh, she, uh, she took part in every single bus game and activity that we had. She always sat on the second row. She was in her uh, 70s or 80s, and she rode for, uh, for many years. Uh, Samantha lived in a one-room, rough lumber house. One room, rough lumber house. I remember, I can see it in my mind's eye, uh, when you walked into the, uh, that one-room uh, house, uh, there was a pot-bellied stove right in the middle of the house. Over to the left was a, uh, was a pot and a wash basin. She didn't have running water in the house. And uh, she, then she had a little kitchen area, and she had a wood a burning stove uh, that she used to cook on. On the right side in that corner uh, was her bed. And then in this corner uh, were a couple of old chairs, the best I recall, straw bottom chairs. I visited with her many a Saturday. I'll never forget I was visiting there one day and I had a cold. I had a terrible cold. And uh, she called me preacher then and uh, even when I was a teenager. And she said, preacher, I've got some cough syrup that will help your cold. It's a true story. I'll never forget it. She walked over to her, to her dresser where her earthly belongings sat, and she picked up a bottle of cough medicine. I'd never seen that brand before. It was called Old Crow. <laughs> and uh, I remember going home and telling my dad, I said, uh, 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 Samantha offered me some cough medicine today. And I said, never heard of it. It's called Old Crow. He said, son, you didn't drink that, did you? I said, no, I just smelled of it, and I felt better just after smelling of it. But anyway, I'll never forget being in there and being in her house, and she was always excited to get, uh, to get on the bus. Now, Samantha was poor by this world's standards, but she was happy. She had a joy and a peace and a contentment that not very many of this world have because you see it wasn't who it wasn't where she was living that made her happy it was who she was living with that made her happy you see her life was hid with Christ in God 
And that's where I am today. You'll have to excuse me if I get overexcited today, but I'm pretty excited about the fact that my life is hid with Christ in God. Because you see, it doesn't matter the circumstance of life that makes me happy. It's who I'm living with that makes me happy. You see, it's not what's seen on the outside that makes a man happy. It's who he's living his life with and what a man lives with, with Christ that gives him the joy and gladness that we have in Christ. Look at it again. Verse number three. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When my wife and I first got married, I'd been the pastor of Bible Baptist Church for a little more than a year. Uh, I'd become the pastor there April 16, 1986. We were married in June, June the 6th, 1987. And uh, I had prepared a little apartment uh, upstairs over the church where we lived. I remember uh, picking out the paneling, and uh, I, I didn't do a very good job. I, I, I picked out paneling that a fellow would put in a hunting cabin is what I did. And uh, it was dumb. And, uh, and, and I bought furniture that a fellow would put in a hunting cabin as if he was going to live alone. I mean, it, it was pretty pathetic. Uh, but, but, but I was happy. I wasn't happy because of the paneling. I wasn't happy because of the furniture. I was happy because who I was living with. You see, she is what brought joy to my life. Now think with me. This world looks at the Christian and looks at the church and oftentimes looks down on the church or looks down on the Christian or may would say of the Christian or may would say of the church as a person would say of Samantha as they drove by. I'll never forget that picture. The house is gone now. A few years ago, I drove through that country and left side of River Canyon, the right side of River Canyon. In fact, most of that area totally changed after the flood of last year. But most folks would have driven by that and they would have said, poor old Samantha. Ah, but if you'd have talked to her, dear friend, Samantha Bush had something that a lot of the world didn't have because they looked at the outside of that old house and they said, poor old Samantha. Ah, but if you went inside, and she had Christ in her heart and she enjoyed her relationship with Christ. And if you ask her how she was doing, she would always say the same thing. Carol Collins reminded me of it this morning. I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing great. She said, that ain't the truth, but that's just how we all grew up saying, I'm doing great. And the truth is, she's doing great in her relationship with Christ. And what the Bible says, I am hid with Christ in God. Now I want to show you another passage of Scripture. If you'll take your Bible and go back a few pages to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he's talking about us being ministers or having a testimony of being a servant or a minister of God. The word minister is often used in government because uh, it is a servant. And the old country uses a minister of, we use secretary until somebody came along and started naming some of them czars. I don't know about you, but that bothered me. I prefer minister. I prefer servant. Uh, secretary is a whole lot closer to that than a czar is. Nevertheless, he talks about how we are to express ourselves in this world, and then he tells us why. I'm going to get stuck here, but that's all right. It's a good place to get stuck. First of all, let's look at our testimony, how we're supposed to, as a child of God, express ourselves. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Now I want you to notice this. By the word of truth, I have that highlighted in my Bible because the Bible teaches me how to live and how to have the right testimony in this world. So notice first, by the word of truth. Second of all, by the power of God. You see, it's not what you see on the outside, it's the power of God that's on the inside that brings joy and gladness to the Christian. 
The world dresses up the outside, and oftentimes it's false advertisement. Whether no matter what it is, I, uh, uh, the nightclub has the most uh, advertisements and all of the shiny things on the on the outside, but it's brokenness on the inside. And church may not look too exciting on the outside, ah, oh, but you get on the inside. There's a lot of joy and happiness and gladness on the inside. By the armor of righteousness, wish I had time to teach all of this. On the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Now notice these, these opposites here. As deceivers and yet true. Now the truth is, many folks will say of a preacher or of a church, they're deceivers. Now the reason or the way you know one is a deceiver or telling the truth is, you don't compare the Bible to the preacher, you compare the preacher to the Bible. You don't hear the... You're not here this morning to hear the preacher. You're here this morning to hear the preacher preach the truth of the Word of God. So some on the outside may say, oh, they're a bunch of deceivers. They don't understand. They, 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 they look at Samantha's house and they think she has to be poor. They look at her house and they say she has to be lonely. They look at her house and what she lives in and they say she has to be sad and wish she had better. But if you go on the inside, you'll find... She's happy as can be because she is with Christ. And sometimes the church or the world looks at the church and they look at the church in a negative manner, but they don't understand because they haven't been inside to know the joy and gladness of our personal relationship with Christ. Because you see, it's not the fancy building that makes us happy. It's the person that we worship that gives us joy. So he says here, as deceivers and yet true. Notice this. As unknown and yet well known. We're not known by this world. But we're well known by those in heaven. We're compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. So he talks about our testimony in the first part of the chapter. And then he talks about how the world sees us. And we're actually the opposite of what is seen. For example, that's an old black book. That's what it's called. Now it's not very attractive in its appearance. It's black. It doesn't have any pictures on the inside. It, it, it doesn't have any bright and shiny things. Oh, but let me tell you something. I found Christ in here. And I found the joy of the Lord in here. And I found the promises of God in here. And you may look at that book compared to another and say, I'll choose that book because it looks fun and it looks happy. Oh, but it may be deceptive. And you may say, I don't want that book because it's the old black book and it tells me what to do and it tells me what I can do and what I can't do. Ah, but i tell you what else it does. It gives me a promise of salvation. It gives me the promise of the Holy Spirit. It gives me a promise of my home in heaven. Heaven. That book is filled with many promises and the world may, may see us as unknown. And isn't it sad for those that are seeking to be well known and yet truth is they're lonely. We're not lonely because we're hid with Christ in God. Look at the next thing. As dying and behold we live. I've had folks say to me, you're wasting your life. All you do is go to church. Why don't you enjoy life a little? Hey, folks, that's the outside looking in. Come on the inside. I'm having a pretty good time. There's a fella. I've told this story. It's been a long time. I haven't heard it in a while, so I'll tell it. Uh, I was in Hazard giving out revival flowers. I was just a teenage boy. I was just a teenage boy. And a fella stopped me. He said, every time I see you, you're passing out tracts or flyers. Why don't you enjoy life a little? I said, well, I do enjoy life. He said, he said, you are going to, you're going to be just like your daddy. He said, you're going to live all your life and die at 40. My dad died of cancer at age 40. What I said to him wasn't real nice, but it's truth. I said to him, I'd rather die at 40 and have my dad's testimony than to live to be 100 and have yours. Now the world may look at us and say they're wasting their life. I don't know about you, but I'm having a big time. 
Now, now, is next week the Super Bowl or a week after? There's a 50% chance of, of your team winning or your team losing. There's a 100% chance that I'm going to be on the winning side every day this week. I, I, I'm not against that, but that's not where my joy is. That's not where my gladness is. I'm hid with Christ in God. Don't judge me by what it looks like on the outside. Come on in and see the joy and the gladness that's on the inside. He goes on. As chastened and not killed. What does that mean? That means this Bible has in it commandments of things that I am not supposed to do and things I'm supposed to do. I've heard it all my life. I hear it every week. Well, I don't want to go to church. People tell me what to do. People tell me what I'm not to, what I'm not supposed to do. And, and they, all of us live by law of some kind. But they say, I don't want to go to church. I mean, you're always just, just all kinds of rules. And they look at the church as the child of God as chastened. But can I tell you something? That chastening serves as a boundary that keeps me alive. I may be living by some rules and standards, but I'm not living by those as those. I have a loving Heavenly Father that is protecting me and protecting my marriage and protecting my family. I'm not being killed as they are living outside the boundaries. It's like the little chihuahua dog that was at the fence and barking at the pit bulldog as if I ever got out of here, I'd show you who the boss is. That's how a lot of Christians are. You may have heard me say I had a chihuahua killed a pit bulldog one time. Truth. That pit bulldog choked to death on my little dog. But anyway. <laughs> chastened and not killed. Look at this. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. The world looks at us as if we're living a sorrowful, sad life. I'm not living a sorrowful, sad life. The Christian life is the only life you can live and in end times of sorrow write some of the greatest songs that have ever been written. You see, because even in sorrow, there's gladness. Even in sorrow as a child of God, you say, how can that be? Because I'm hid with Christ in God. Don't judge me by the wood on the exterior. Don't judge me by the pot-bellied stove. Don't judge me by what I don't have in the world. I have a Christ that lives with me and Christ and I are hid with God, in God, and there is joy and gladness of how and who I'm living with. I love this next statement as poor, yet making many rich. As poor, poor old Christians go to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meeting, visitation, bus ministry, poor old Christians. You know what we live our life doing? Making people rich. You say, what, what do you mean ba making people rich? You see, without Christ, you're impoverished. Without Christ, you, you may have all that this world has to offer, but without Christ, you have nothing. Without Christ, you live on death row. Without Christ, your destination is hell. Without Christ, it's eternal dying. Oh, but with Christ, we become rich with Him. And the Bible says, I became joint heirs with Christ as a child of God. So every child I lead to Christ. You know what I do? I make them rich. You know what? Every teenager that trusts Christ, excuse me while I get excited, every teenager gets saved. Every man, every woman gets saved. They may look at us and say, poor old preacher doesn't have any fun. Of course, they don't know me if they say that. They're looking at it from the outside. But I am rich because my life is hid with Christ in God and we'll go about on our bus routes today. You know what we're doing? We're making people rich in Christ as we go out on Wednesday afternoon, teens and college students and adults and giving the gospel and winning people to Christ. We're going about making people rich. You've never been rich until you come to know Christ as Savior. Then he says this, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holds all the wealth of the world in his hands, of rubies, of diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. Hey, folks, I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the, uh, of the king. I'm joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, right in the middle of that passage, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 10, it talks about the word 
of truth. That may look like a boring book. It may just look like a black leather bound book. Oh, but inside this book are the wonderful riches of Christ. I'm thankful for the word of truth. It's not the cover that makes it appealing. It's the promises within that make it wonderful. In fact, there's several books that this book talks about that changes my life. I'm glad for the day that the Word of God was opened to me at an altar at Bible Baptist Church in Xenia, Ohio, and I saw and I heard that Jesus loved me and if I would call on Him, He would forgive me of my sin and would give me eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. I accepted that invitation and I'm glad I'm a child of the King. There's more than one book. Take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Go to the end of that chapter. Let's go to verse number 11. I'm not going to finish today. I'll finish tonight. I'll finish tonight. One fellow said, you're preaching like a roll of baloney. You can just cut it off anywhere and I'll cut this one off at 30 minutes and I'll finish tonight. Verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. Let me turn on this microphone right here, Brother Joe. Yeah, I want you to help me a minute. In heaven, there is another book. Just stand right there. In heaven, there is another book. This book is the Word of God. But in heaven, there's another book. And I've got it right here. What does this, what does this say this book is right here? Read it. Book of Life. Book of Life. All right. In heaven, there is a book of life. Read whose name's in that book of life. Jeff Fugan. Hallelujah. <laughs> my name's in the book of life. Look right there, Brother Young. The book of life, my name. Your name is in there. Yes, sir. Is your name in there? Is your name in the book of life? Not here. This is not the real book of life in heaven. <laughs> is your name in the book of life? Hey, the world can say what they want to say. They, if they're not careful, they'll drive down the road and say, poor old Christians. Poor old church. Hey world, let me show you something. Look at this book of life right here. Look at there whose name's in that book. Aren't you glad your name is in the book of life? Aren't you glad you have that book? It may not look appealing. I don't look like a Playboy magazine. It doesn't look like a National Enquirer. It doesn't look like an enticing book. It just says Holy Bible on the outside. And its pages are just black and white. And there are no pictures in it. There's no color in it. Ah, but I find here in Revelation chapter 21, and there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. And there's no darkness in that city. And there's there's no sorrow and there's no sadness and there are no funerals and there are no funeral homes and there are no hospitals in heaven. That's what I like about that book. And then I open this book as a book of life and guess what? My name's there. Wait a minute. There are other books that are there. You see that in Revelation chapter 20 and the books were open. What's the name of, what's the name of that book there, Joel? Book of Sins. Sins. So all sins that are committed, whether they're sins of omission or sins of commission, they're written down in those books that are in heaven. You see that there? Joel, I want you to read this list of sins under my name right here. Go ahead, read them. None listed. There's none listed? Hallelujah. I don't have a single sin in the book of sins. They've all been blotted out. Every last one of them. When I got saved, he blotted every sin I had out of the book of sins. And when you look in this book, it says what? What's that book? Book of Life. And what's that name right there? Jeff Fugan. And what does this say right here? Book of Sins. And what, what's listed there? None. Not a thing. You can call me what you want to call me. You can feel sorry for me if you want to feel sorry for me. But I'm hid with Christ in God and I'm having a good time. There's one more book. I'll finish this tonight, but I've got to tell you where the books are. 
What's the title of this book right here? Book of Works. Book of Works. So the Book of Works are the Book of Righteousness. You can't go to heaven without righteousness. You understand? You can't go to heaven without righteousness. And the Bible says that he records the righteousness. What's under my name right there on the book of righteousness? The righteousness of Christ. On my name? You mean every time Jesus was kind, he put it on my account? You mean every time that Jesus was holy, he put that on my account? You mean, you mean every time that Jesus did a righteous act, he didn't put it on his account, but he put it on my account. I'm going to heaven not because of who I am, but because what he's done for me. Right there it is. It's the book of works. And under that book of works in my name is the righteousness of Christ. Now stand with me. I've got to stop. You can tell I'm stirred up a little bit about this. Now, now, now listen to me. Don't listen to those on the outside that would say, poor old Samantha, look where she lives. By the way, what you live in doesn't determine your happiness. I've met a lot of old drunks that live in a one-room house. I've met a lot of happy people that live in a one-room house. I've met miserable people that live in mansions. And I've met happy people that live in mansions. Can I tell you something? It's not the one-room house, and it's not the mansion that makes either party happy. It's who you're living with. And our life is hid with Christ in God. Our heads are bowed. If you're here this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, He invites you to receive Him. It's as simple as he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's as simple as if he said, Here's a glass of water. If you'll just receive it and take it, he'll give you eternal life. The joy of the Christian life is not what's on the outside. It's who we are hid with in God. Heavenly Father,